Thank you very much. So I'm James Goldstone. I'm Kieran Mallon. Um, and we've got a lot to get through and what was 20 minutes is now about 18 minutes. Um, so we're just to um, tell you what we're going to talk about, we're going to begin by setting the scene um, uh, and talk about a couple of important elements of the structural elements of the trust um, and also the dividend policy um, uh, that, the, that, the, that the board has set. Um, we're then going to tell you how um, Kieran and I invest, uh, what we look for, or why we look for it. Uh, we're going to show you how the portfolio is invested, and we're going to explain why we think the UK stock market looks attractive and um, why we expect our approach to deliver over time. So, um, first, the structure, and this is the, the right slide, thank you. Um, Select Trust is actually slightly unusual in, in terms of its structure. Um, it's got total AUM of about £250 million, pounds, but that's split across four different share classes, each with different objectives, and you can see those uh, in that light blue box um, on, on the left-hand side. And the structure confers the um, uh, ability to switch once a quarter between the share classes uh, without triggering a, disposable, uh, a, a disposal for capital gains tax purposes, which, depending on where the shares are, hold, are held could be um, advantageous and we think that's a key differentiator, it's, it's quite unusual. Um, now Kieran and I run just the UK equity share portfolio, the NAV um, uh, of that portfolio is about £160 million pounds, uh, and it's that and, and only that that we're going to talk to you about um, today. The second bit of uh, important scene setting is around income. So the, uh, the UK share class that we're going to talk to you about, it's in the income sector, it uh, pays a quarterly dividend and the trailing yield on the shares is 3.4% today, uh, as well as the four share classes that James uh, described. Uh, another unusual feature of, of Select is that the board can supplement dividends uh, from capital. Uh, for the UK share class, the board has chosen to do that uh, to varying degrees since 2016. Um, that's provided uh, consistency of dividends to shareholders, so it can be reassuring in periods uh, when dividends in the portfolio um, have been cut. Uh, and as we know in the market generally last year, the widespread dividend cuts uh, never left the, uh, the dividend uh, uh, last year group. Um, this topping up from capital uh, has an, uh, another advantage. Uh, for us, uh, it allows us to manage the portfolio in a more flexible manner uh, with an eye to the total return and to try to generate uh, returns for, for, for our investors from capital and from income as well. Next slide, please. So the objective of the trust and what Kieran has just described about the, um, the board's approach to dividends. Um, that's enabled us to construct a portfolio that's that's more balanced. So as you look at this slide, we have holdings that would appear on the left-hand side, companies like BAT, like Vodafone, that pay um, significant dividends today. Um, but we also have holdings in companies that would appear on the right-hand slide, uh, at the right-hand side of the slide, companies like Bunzel and, and, and Kroger, um, which are reinvesting to deliver meaningful growth in both capital and dividends in the future. Um, so it's a balanced portfolio of companies with different attributes uh, and a portfolio that can deliver both income today and capital and income growth in the, in the, in the future. And uh, next slide please, thank you. Um, so that flexibility that, that we've, we've made reference to is um, uh, uh, we think is uh, important and, um, uh, and it's allowed us in, in making the portfolio to to focus on uh, what we think is, is, is most important in, in putting the portfolio together. And, and we've worked out over time managing money um, what we think makes a good company, uh, what makes a good investment, and what makes a good portfolio. Uh, and that's what we've put together for the, for the trust. It's relatively concentrated, it's our very best ideas, and we hope it's capable of delivering returns, uh, whatever the weather. Uh, now, by good company and a good investment, we mean companies that make good returns on shareholders 
money with a credible management team that we can trust to allocate shareholders capital appropriately um, and we mean companies uh, with the right balance sheets and whose shares are attractively valued and by attractively valued shares well we, we try to relate what it is you're purchasing with what it is the company is and uh, it's the same kind of reasoning goes behind when you buy a house or buy a leaf blower or whatever it's about relating the the qualities of what you're buying with what you have to pay for it and uh, and that's what we spend our time uh, focusing on and um, uh, and it's a, 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 a as much an art as a science but it's about trying to find a, those opportunities uh, where there is a likely to be good returns for for investors and on the next slide uh, we put, show a picture of how the the the, uh, the dividend looks in the in the portfolio so the forecast for the next 12 months, uh, as shown on the slide, is about 3.3%. Uh, now, that's before the impact of uh, gearing, and we'll tell you in a moment what that is, and, uh, and also before the board uses it for any flexibility it may choose to use to top up with, with, with capital. And as shown on here as well, uh, that dividend in the portfolio is well diversified and also well covered by earnings of the constituents. So if we get to the next slide, um, we found that when we present to investors, people like to understand what the exposures in the portfolio are. And although Kira and I are very much bottom up investors um, and therefore you know, this, is, this is entirely an output, we have cut the portfolio into five thematic uh, groups. And so going from left to right, you'll see um, we've got just over a quarter of the portfolio exposed to UK domestic companies. We've got a similar amount uh, exposed to international value. I think that speaks for itself. You know, businesses that are um, you know, predominantly outside the UK, but where we see uh, a very modest valuation. We've got a similar amount, again, exposed to international growth companies where um, you know, potentially the, the, the valuation is slightly higher, but we've chosen them because they justify that valuation with a very strong growth track record and very strong growth outlook. Um, we've got currently 7% in our recovery. Uh, what we've shown here is a re recovery um, group. Now, all of those names are in that group today because they're recovering from the impact of, uh, of the pandemic and you'll see if you know anything about those companies they're all um, operating in an area of the economy that was very severely impacted by the pandemic but as we come out of it uh, recovering very nicely we still see further recovery to come and then finally what we've called transformers and when we say transformers we're really talking about companies that the market thinks of in a certain way um, but we think we've identified an aspect of what the company does or a new activity that is not yet currently recognized by the market and therefore not reflecting the valuation and it's our anticipation that when the market does begin to factor um, that, that new activity in that there'll be a positive impact on, on the on the share price and on the valuation of, of the shares and uh, we thought it'd be useful just to give a thumbnail sketch of something from each category um, so uh, if we start with national grid which is in uk domestic um actually half the business is in the uk and half of the business is in the, uh, in, the in the us um it's predominantly electricity uh, transmission and distribution uh, networks uh with some gas as well um in, in in the us and some in the uk and uh regulated utility if you look back over the history of the business um uh, it's done a very good job for shareholders, actually, a combination of, of income, uh, growing dividends and capital growth um, and, a, uh, and in, with its own very particular risk characteristics, a very good sort of diversifying the portfolio as well. Um, but what's exciting, I think, about it now is that they are pivoting the business towards more electricity. Uh, and the pithy way to express that is the UK, if it wants to get to its carbon reduction targets, is going to need twice as much grid because we know that heating houses and we know that transport is electrifying and, uh, and we, that will mean a lot of investment needed in the, uh, in, in the national grid. And here's another pithy uh, uh, thought is that 
an electric vehicle, electric car outside a house is like an extra house. That's how much power they need. So um, all of that means investment opportunities for national grid and growth, which I think is very exciting. Now, in the international um, value box, um, Hiscox is a, an international insurer and reinsurer. It's got a very long track record of organic investment to grow into adjacent areas. It began as a, 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 a Lloyd's vehicle, um, just operating in the uh, commercial markets at, at Lloyd's. Um, many years ago, it began to invest in a retail brand. And if you've caught a train somewhere in the home counties in the last decade, you've probably seen a Hiscox billboard um, at some point. Um, that's a, absolutely a scale business, been very, very successful um, organic project. And uh, about 10 years ago, Hiscox decided to start to invest in a um, commercial uh, insurance um, business in the US for small and medium sized enterprises. They spent about $500 million over that period. Um, so it's been a heavy investment. The business today has about $400 million of premium. Um, but Hiscox have made the choice rather than to um, earn a profit from this new venture to continue to continually invest the proceeds into further growing the brand. And the current rate of growth is about 25% annually. And because it's not currently generating a profit, when you look at the Hiscox P&L, there's nothing in the P&L, in the, in, the, in the profit line, for what we think is the most exciting part of the group. And therefore, when people apply a multiple of earnings, uh, and compare his Cox to its peers, um, implicitly, given that the rating of the shares is broadly in line with um, the, the peer group, there's nothing in the price for, as I say, what we think is potentially the most exciting um, uh, aspect of the investment case. And so we think that's a, a genuine value situation, and we think it's something that over time, as this business continues to grow, and there's a, a long, long runway of growth for it um, that can be reflected in the share price, and, um, uh, and yeah, we're very excited about it. And if we look at international growth, now the UK market is blessed with some world leading businesses. And um, one I wanted to mention was, was Croda, uh, it's a chemical business. Uh, the heritage of that and still the heart of that company is the chemistry uh, of fats and oils and products derived therefrom. And that's not oil out of the ground, that's oil from renewable sources. And so that's one great thing about it. Its ESG credentials are wonderful because it's largely uh, largely renewable uh, inputs into its products. Huge range of different kinds of chemicals are derived from those, those inputs that are used in a huge range of, of end markets. Essentially, they, 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 they help their customers do two things. One is either um, enhancing the product that it goes into. So that might be they, for example, uh, pr produce seed coatings which allow seeds to germinate more reliably. Or it might be something which a customer uses which makes the real performance promise that goes on a product. And, um, uh, and so amongst the many things they do, they, they, they might do an active ingredient which helps protect skin from UV radi radiation that can go into a skin cream. Um, very exciting at the moment, however, is the part of the business in healthcare where um, the COVID vaccines based on mRNA need some means to protect the strand of mRNA while it gets into your body and gets to where it needs to go in your body. And the way that's achieved is a, a little ball of fat around it. And that little ball of fat in the case of uh, Pfizer's uh, uh, COVID vaccine, some of the ingredients for that come from Come from Croda, so that that's a perfect example of the kind of thing that Croda does. That, that that's of huge value to the end product, and um, and is a, a obviously currently is a very exciting area of, uh, of growth for them. So just with an eye on the clock, I'll probably accelerate a bit. In the recovery box, we've got DFS Furniture. Uh, it's the biggest sofa retailer in the UK. Um, about just over a third of the UK sofa market both from um, showrooms, which you've probably all seen on retail parks, but also online. The great thing about sofas is that almost everybody that buys one wants to sit on one. So this is an area of retail where that physical presence has real value. And the fact that DFS is so big, 
35 nearly percent market share and um, with that scale uh, have a, a completely different margin structure to what is a very fragmented and weak uh, competitor set is really now being brought to bear and so um, the prospect for further market share growth there's more and more of those com competitors struggle struggle to compete with BFS whether it's the manufacturing um, whether it's in the what BFS can afford to pay for a click online uh, whether it's in the negotiations with the tenants it's got genuine advantages um, which which we think are embedded and it's now beginning to grow in adjacencies like bedroom furniture so um, it, there has been a recovery um, since the pandemic but we think there's a lot further to go and the, the valuation will be very very modest and then finally and i'll also speed up um, next was the transformer that we wanted to talk about um, we know that the retailer next and um uh, uh, and it's um, a fantastic track record great margin great balance sheets um fantastic management track record it's a very tricky sector to do well they've shown that they can do well but what's very interesting at the moment is uh, they've won and proven to be a great business online and they're taking all of that capability they've got which is everything from warehousing to websites to fulfillment and they're, they're offering that to third parties and that's a fantastic uh, growth opportunity uh, for them for the future we think and it's unrecognized we, we believe in the in the uh, in the in the in the uh, in the, the the view of the market generally at the moment of next shares next slide please and uh so this is the performance so so we've shown you you know how the trust is structured uh how we think about investing how the portfolio is positioned uh today but how is it uh, how has it worked um well uh both the recent and the long-term performance which is the uh, the top two lines on the chart uh of the share price and the net asset value uh both short term and long term has been very strong in performance outperforming the, the FTSE all share by some margin uh, uh so it's you know it's a, it's a good track record there i think um, we appreciate however uh that uh the um the uk stock market uh faces a lot of competition from other places in which you can invest um, and so we thought we'd finish off by trying to persuade you that despite rumours to the contrary, the UK stock market is not dead. So if we just look quickly at the next slide, um, I think there's a, a perception that the, the reason that the UK um, stock market has underperformed the US is all down to the technology sector where you know, we're all users of these mega uh, tech platforms and um, they're all quoted in the US and they just don't exist in in, in the UK and that has certainly been a factor but actually it, it's not the only explanation um, and if you look here and um, we thought given it was December we might give you a bit of a Christmas quiz with anonymized four companies that we hold in the portfolio um, the companies that we hold are all the dark blue lines so top left hand side international telecommunications company listed in the UK you might guess that one Top right hand side, the dark blue line is a, an internationally an international medical equipment company listed in the UK. Bottom left, it's a, an international electricity and gas distributor, which we may already have mentioned, uh, is the dark blue. And in the bottom right is, an, is, a, is, a, is a bank, an international bank. And what you'll see is that ever since the um, Brexit referendum, which is where these charts start, each of those four very international businesses have materially underperformed their US peer group. And so um, we think it's about a lot more than the, the, the US tech sector. These are only four examples. There are many more. Uh, and in our experience, these sorts of situations do tend to resolve, them, resolve themselves in time, either via a re-rating or potentially via M&A. And obviously, we've seen a bit of M&A in the UK market in, in recent times. Um, and next slide, please. And a, a different way to look at valuation. Uh, uh, is to look at um, how markets are currently valued versus their past. This chart shows the current price to book ratio for various markets against the median of the past 20 years. Um, and uh, if it's below the light blue line, it means it's below, it's at median for the past 20 years. Uh, and the UK of the ones we've shown here, which includes the world index, but also some major markets around the world, and um, uh, the UK is is below and, um, and most other markets um, 
aren't so um, and that's been the case for for quite a, while, a few years now but we the, the discount is beginning to uh, beginning to narrow and then just finally on the last slide we, we thought we probably shouldn't go all the way through a presentation without giving you some thoughts about the, the current environment um, I'd say that we are suitably cautious around the pandemic um, I mean I think as we discovered last night there are still risks um, not least with um, uh, the government response to the pandemic which can um, have and, 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 and can potentially have further impact on the economy and on the earnings of the companies that uh, are in the UK market and um, so we're suitably cautious but at the same time we are hopeful that the world will at some stage learn to live with the virus um, and, and, and therefore um, you know the recovery that we've seen um, since the since the depths of, uh, of, of, of March last year uh, can be sustained. Um, I think the second point I'll pick off this slide is just inflation. We've seen the highest levels of inflation in a generation um, as the economy has reopened and we've been compounded by all the supply chain disruption uh, and that may not prove to be transitory and um, you know, typically that will be thought of as not great news in an absolute sense for equities. Um, however, everything that we've tried to convey about the portfolio is that it's balanced and we have a number of companies that we hold in the portfolios that would actually be you know, significant beneficiaries from high and sustained inflation. Um, so overall, I think we'll just finish off by saying, you know, there's nothing in the, in the, in the current view that changes our confidence, the long-term prospects of the, of the companies that we own. Um, the portfolio is balanced, it can perform in a, it's been designed to perform in a range of economic and, and market regimes. The track record for the trust is strong uh, and the structure and the board's approach to dividends are, we believe, real advantages. Yeah.